so we want to look at the various places that we want visitors to explore and get to and make sure that that experience is fun, safe, easy, and maybe even an experience into itself. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Destination Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Stoker. Reminder for everyone, I own an advertising agency called Relic, and we've been in the tourism industry for almost nine years now and kept finding kind of the same problems, challenges, difficulties with uh, tourism destinations and said, you know what, let's start a podcast and let's start kind of aggregating some of the things that we've learned over the years, bring on some cool guests and, and share with everyone. So uh, excited to be here with the Destination Marketing Podcast. We've got a great guest for you today. Her name is Kim Sidoriak, and she is with the Santa Monica, California CVB. And Kim, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Adam. I'm happy to be here. Oh, we're happy you're here. You know, you are in a very coveted destination. Mm -hmm. You you get some great weather. And as I sit and look out this window and I see all the snow coming down, the only place I wish I could be right now is Santa Monica. Absolutely. I mean, that's the dream is 70 degrees in February. So. (laughs) Oh, man. Yep. Yep. You're living the dream. Well, (laughs) You know, Kim, whenever we have someone on the show, we like to just ask a couple of questions to get the get the mental juices flowing. So we'll do the same with you. Uh, what is your dream destination? If you go anywhere in the world, Kim, where would it be? I love this question, but of course, I could never narrow it down to one. And of course, it's um, probably just an ever-changing and evolving list. Sure. Um, but right now at the top of it is Patagonia, Slovenia, and Turkey. And just two experiences, not destination specific, that are at the top of my list are seeing the Northern Lights and going to another city for the Summer Olympics. Man, okay, you've got a good list here. This is this is a <laughs> comprehensive list. So I want to go back because you mentioned several things. You said Patagonia, uh-huh. Slovenia, and Turkey, right? Yeah. Okay, give me the why on each of these first, and then and then we'll talk about the experiences. Okay, the Patagonia, um, just the wild landscape and the nature, um, the wildlife, the lakes, the mountains just seem so um, raw and untouched. And um, that's really exciting to me. Um, Slovenia, I think their efforts in sustainability are really interesting. And um, I have a neighbor who's Slovenian, and I think she's fantastic. So she kind of Uh introduced me to that culture. And Turkey, um, because I've heard that the beaches are really beautiful, but of course, I would love to go to Istanbul and soak up that culture, but also for the beaches. Okay. So I, I'm really impressed with your dream destinations because <laughs> you mentioned three. Most people will say one. You mentioned three, and none of them have been mentioned before on the show. And that, Oh, do I get a set of good. steak knives or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you get the Cutco steak, gonna, steak knife. <laughs> Sent your way, okay? Um, <laughs> but no, that's really cool. You've come up with three unique destinations, um, that all of which sound amazing. You know, I, yeah. I've never actually heard about Turkey's beaches. Yeah. How in the world did you, did you discover their amazing beaches? Uh, one of my mentors in my early uh, advertising career had had kind of spread the word about it to me. It just intrigued me and never would have thought Turkey for beaches. So it's just kind of been something I've been interested in. Great. Great. Okay. And you said you would love to experience the Northern Lights Mm -hmm. and you'd like to go to another destination for the Summer Olympics. Mm -hmm. I got to know the why. I mean, the Northern Lights are amazing and beautiful. And I actually spent a summer in Alaska and didn't stay long enough in the summer to actually catch the Northern Lights. So I was pretty disappointed. Um, But I wish I could have. So I understand the why on the Northern Lights. Yeah. (laughs) Tell me, tell me the Summer Olympics specifically, why you'd want to be a part of that elsewhere. Um, I've always, you know, had such an interest and passion for the Summer Olympics. It's, you know, something I watch every year and get choked up about all the stories. And I've had a few friends um, go to uh, the Winter Olympics in Vancouver and um, told me all about their experience. So I think, you know, my... My interest in just the Summer Olympics in general, and obviously, um, if I'm living in Los Angeles in 2028, I'll probably go to the games because it's in my backyard. But I would also really love to, you know, either go to Paris or future Summer Olympics uh, cities. Awesome. 
Awesome. Yeah. You know, they had the Winter Olympics here in Salt Lake in 2002. Mm -hmm. And I went to that and it really is a surreal experience. I mean, it's not the Summer Olympics. I think (laughs) I I, I had to work a lot harder to stay warm than you would. But uh, it it really is pretty cool to be a part of that atmosphere. And and the Olympic atmosphere is is, it's unique. And so, yeah, yeah, I think that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, Okay, Kim, thank you for sharing those with us. Um, You've got a lot of dream destinations, which (laughs) which is good. It's good to have a long list. Uh, Tell me about where you've been. What's your favorite place you've ever visited? So I have a special place in my heart for New Zealand. Um, It is the first place that I traveled by myself. I did the Northern North Island with a friend of mine and then did the South Island by myself, Um, drove across the the South Island. And The crazy experiences that I had there um, from a natural perspective are what stand out to me. I dug a jacuzzi on a beach that had uh, hot water underneath the sand with a shovel. I um, went underground uh, cave diving. Um, I hiked a glacier. I uh, sampled some amazing wines. Um, it's just the, the natural experiences. I, uh, swam in the ocean, the middle of the ocean with dolphins. Um, so I just think that the way that you can interact with nature there, um, was really special to me. Goodness. It sounds like you lived an entire lifetime in New Zealand with all and, the cool stuff you got to do. <laughs> and the funny thing is, I think I was there for about two and a half weeks and I feel like I only scratched the surface. So yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, so New Zealand has always been on my list. Uh, yeah. It's definitely somewhere I intend to go. Uh, I, I love the sound of it. I want to hear about you digging a jacuzzi in the sand to the warm water that was under the sand. How how did that come about? Okay, so there's an area called uh, Coromandel, and I think it's um, just it's called the Jacuzzi Beach. And uh, you get to the beach and there's uh, like geothermal waters underneath the sand. And so you can rent a shovel. And so my friend and I showed up, rented our shovels, and you just dig your own jacuzzi. So no pretty fantastic. <laughs> yeah. That sounds incredible. Yeah. Well, good. Okay. I, I feel like one, one thing I've already learned about you having you here on the show is we could probably talk about some of the cool stuff that you've done for an entire episode without even getting into destination marketing <laughs> because you've, you've had some good experience. I, I'd, I'd like to, to spend a whole half hour talking about New Zealand, but we better get into the, into the meat of it. Uh, tell me a little bit about your background and how you got into tourism, Kim. Sure. So I started my career uh, out of college at an advertising agency at uh, Saatchi and Saatchi in Los Angeles. And, Very good agency. Yep. Yeah, and uh, at the time, ninety um, percent of the agency business was devoted to the Toyota account. And um, I started realizing I was there for about three years, and I started realizing that every year when the LA Auto Show came to town, my coworkers would get really excited and they geek out on what the latest car stuff was and the new releases. And I just didn't share that same level of enthusiasm (laughs) um, for cars and um, reviewing copy all day, focusing on, you know, how the hybrid engine works in the Prius or the torque on the SUVs. I just realized that you really, if you're marketing a product, you really need to be interested in that industry. And that's when I thought, okay, you know, maybe I need to move away from automotive and um, get into something that is really my passion. And I'm really grateful to Saatchi and Saatchi. They actually allowed me to take a two-month leave of absence. And Really? Yeah. I was able to backpack around Europe for two months and come back to a job, which is, again, forever grateful to them for allowing me to do that. Yeah. And that's where the travel bug bit me hard. And um, I came back from that trip and, and gave Sachi and Sachi another year um, before leaving and getting a start into um, the tourism industry. Um, my interest at the time from the tour- tourism perspective was really on the boutique, boutique hotel side. Um, this is when um, Ian Schrager Hotels and Kimpton and Jaude Vivre were really 
taking off and I loved staying and, and reading about um, boutique hotel product. Um, I was able to find a job at Hilton Hotels. They had a corporate office in Beverly Hills and thought, okay, well, let me start big. And, you know, hopefully next step can be um, into uh, smaller boutique properties. So really enjoyed my time at, at Hilton and I uh, worked for their loyalty program and uh, ended up finding this small tourism board called Santa Monica Travel and Tourism and thought, this exists? You know, I knew uh-huh. that Las Vegas tourism existed and I knew that countries had tourism boards, but I didn't realize that uh, smaller communities had tourism boards. So when I found right. the job, I thought, oh, this is so perfect. This is my dream job. And here I am. And how long ago was that? 13 years. <laughs> 13 years. Good for you. Yeah. Time flies when you're having fun. Well, you must be in a great destination if you stayed in the same place for 13 years, because I know in the in the tourism industry, especially, there's a lot of opportunity to kind of move from one destination to another. So probably says a lot about the quality of life there in Santa Monica. Sure, absolutely. It's a, it's a wonderful it's a wonderful community and wonderful place to promote. Well, tell me about it. Tell me about Santa Monica and kind of the the product that you are promoting. Sure. Uh, Santa Monica is the beach city of Los Angeles, essentially. And it's really the place that you're envisioning if you think about Southern California. It's the beach and the palm trees and the sunsets and the ocean. Um, But beyond that, it is its own city. um, And it's a pretty bustling place for being small. We're um, just 8.3 square miles. It's it's not a quiet... Is that all? Yeah. Wow. (laughs) It's not a quiet beach town like many um, Southern California coastal communities. It's a very creative, progressive, and vibrant community. Great. Great. Okay. And you've been there for 13 years. Uh, Your current role, what is that? Uh, Chief Marketing Officer. Chief Marketing Officer there at Santa Monica. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that you mentioned when you and I were talking a little bit about, uh, you know, what you, what you do at Santa Monica and, and what makes your destination unique. You mentioned a study that you guys have done, and this is really where I'd like to focus a large portion of our discussion today, because I'm really, research is really important to me, and a lot of destinations either struggle to be able to afford it or struggle to justify spending the money on research that needs to be spent. And you know, you guys have done this brand perception study, and I want to hear kind of what led you to decide you need that, what got you to pull the trigger, uh, and and maybe we'll start into what that experience was like. Okay. So um, this started because our city was about to embark on a uh, an economic sustainability plan and strategy. Um, so looking 30 years ahead, what's Santa Monica's economy going to look like um, when cars drive themselves, when, you know, automa- automation um, changes the nature of work, um, and when workers are no longer fixed to a space. Um, so in advance, as a precursor, our city manager wanted to look at how is Santa Monica perceived from a traveler's perspective, from a, a corporation's perspective, from the resident perspective, like what is the perception of Santa Monica right now? So we were really lucky that um, he invested funding into doing this study. So it was city funded and he really believed in, in this um, assessing the destination brand. Great. Okay. So he wanted to know kind of, and great leadership, by the way, to be willing oh, to make that investment and to, and to, to be thinking that far ahead. Cause a lot of people I think in, in some of these roles are just fighting to keep their head above water, water on a daily basis. And, and this guy's looking 30 years ahead. So I think that's pretty, pretty good to point out. Yeah. Uh, but then, so he asked that question, so what did you guys do next? You, you were doing this tour or this uh, um, economic sustainability study for Santa Monica. Mm-hmm. How did you then get into choosing a methodology and process and all of that? We worked with a company called the Caraggio Group out of Portland. Um, we had recently wrapped up a five-year strategic planning process with them. So okay. our stakeholders, you know, our, our city partners, our um, board of directors, our various stakeholder groups, 
um, have built a good rapport with our, uh, with our consultants from the Caragio group. There's a good level of trust there. Um, yeah, but good group. What, I've met those yeah, guys. Yeah. But what we loved about the proposal when they submitted was that they partnered um, in delivering the proposal with Sparkloft to uh, utilize the methodology of social media sentiment analysis as uh-huh. part of the brand perception study. So why was that such a critical point for you guys? I think the critical point for that was, um, and it really rang true when we started presenting the results of this, was we wanted to leave no stone unturned. Um, we, um, from a tactical perspective, we did uh, 2,300 residential surveys. We did the social media sentiment analysis, looking back three years worth of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, YouTube, forums, and whatnot, going back to uh, 2015. Um, we did digital surveys to potential visitors in five languages. Um, we even conducted focus groups among travel agents in Brazil, India, Australia, United Kingdom, France, and Germany. And then um, one-on-one interviews with about 39 community leaders and stakeholders. So the breadth of the research and the multiple tactics really kind of positioned us that no stone was left unturned. And when we presented the results, um, I think our stakeholders could see that no, we, we, we talk to potential visitors, we talk to potential um, companies, we talk to travel agents, we talk to residents, we talk to city leaders. So um, I think that our stakeholders really saw that we kind of talked to all the various audiences. Yeah, that's great. And one of the, one of the things that I want to go back to is that that social media sentiment analysis that you guys worked on. You know, a lot of people don't realize there's tools out there that you can actually see the the sentiment of yeah. of the types of posts about your destination you know mm-hmm. uh one of the tools that we've used for that is called meltwater mm-hmm. uh and and meltwater a lot of people see it as a pr tool and don't realize that it has that social media capability as well and then there's there's a lot of other tools as well that that people will use to to do that sentiment analysis but it's one thing the the thing that i like about doing that social media sentiment analysis is that If you get somebody in a room and you start asking them questions, it is human nature to attempt to tell you what you want to hear or what they think you want to hear, right? Right. But on social media, you are getting the unfiltered, un you know, uncut, here's what they think. And if it's good, it's really good. And if it's bad, guess what? It's very bad. (laughs) Right. So so I love that you guys included that as as part of the process. Were there any ahas or, or anything that caught you off guard in the sentiment analysis that, that you'd be willing to share? Um, ahas, I mean, I think, you know, for us, we were, we were trying to see what certain issues or potential threats were headed our way. And I'll give you a few examples. So um, as many California communities are experiencing and many tourism destinations in California are experiencing, we have a rising homeless population. Okay. And um, it's something that if you live, work, and play here, you are experiencing when you're out and about. Um, so we wanted to look at this research as a way to see, is that affecting um, the potential visitor's perception of this as a place to travel to? And uh, we thought it would be a huge factor. And that was one of the ahas of it did show up, but not to the level that we would have thought. Because you see it every day. You're kind of paranoid about it, right? And, and right. you know, visitor is doing something completely different and, and experiencing the entire destination, not from the same perspective as you. Right. And I think that also the other interesting thing about this methodology, especially as it related to social media sentiment analysis, is we benchmarked uh, against other destinations. So the other aha moment was there are other destinations who... Um, the homelessness issue is really trickling up and, and driving some social media conversation. So for us, it was a cautionary tale of we need to really address this because looking down the line, um, this could be a, a big factor. Yeah, really interesting. Okay, I like that. Uh, what else did you find? We also found that um, visitors love our luxury accommodations. Um, we have um, some wonderful hotel product that's driving some um, some positive sentiment. But uh, we have a number of new properties that are opening up across Los Angeles County. 
And this is, you know, the shiny new stuff. So, you know, big sustainability efforts, luxury product, new, 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 um, technologically, you know, forward thinking. So if we don't look at our hotel product and ensure that we are, you know, our hotels are making renovations and, and reinvesting in the property and that our community is allowing these, uh, these investments to happen, um, that's something that's at risk for us. Yeah, kind of an interesting intersection between tourism and economic development, right? That, right. that it's a balance that, that you've got to strike there. And that's why I love that the study came, and I'm going back a little bit, but I love that the study came at the city level and it wasn't just tourism because yeah. some of these studies, if you do all the work just from the tourism perspective, you're missing so much opportunity to evaluate the community as a whole. So exactly. uh, it sounds like you guys came at it from a really good angle. Yeah. And we had great partners, you know, in, in the city in, in funding this. Great. Well, any other uh, like major ahas that, that you want to talk about before we move on? One of the other um, findings uh, that's been, uh, you know, we we're aware of, but good to see it pop up in the research is that um, just the cost of living and the cost to start and run a business in Santa Monica is, is changing the vibe of the community. Um, again, small, small beach city, but a lot happening. And um, there are policies that are in place that are making it cost prohibitive to start a unique business. And um, we definitely want to look at that. And we want to keep Santa Monica interesting and authentic. And if the only businesses that can afford to be here are, are chains, large chains, then how is that going to affect the the visitor experience? How is that going to affect the resident and, and business experience? So that was something definitely to look at. Yeah, that's an important insight because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people will look at, oh, well, visitors having a great time, great. But if the cost of having a business makes it too expensive for your local mom and pop shop to be there, right. that is potentially going to hurt the customer experience, but it hasn't manifested itself yet. That's you guys, you guys found some interesting stuff in that study. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, that's what I say. The breadth and depth of the, the research was really a big part of why so many of our community members and stakeholders bought in because it was being, it was shown at all sides, you know, from various audiences and, um, you know, no one could argue with the data. So, so coming out of this, this brand perception study that you did, what were the action items for you and your team that you needed to execute on to stay true to the plan or to, to, to respond to what you were seeing in that study? So um, at the conclusion of the brand perception study, we went into uh, the development of a experience management plan. So obviously um, this is the hot topic among tourism boards today is looking at you know, long-term infrastructure and capacity and management. Um, so we kind of utilize all this research as great fodder to begin this plan. And ultimately, the meat of this is, again, looking at from now to 2030, what will Santa Monica look like and how can we get to uh, what we want Santa Monica to look like? So there's um, eight strategies that um, I'd be happy to talk through uh, if we have time. Um, yeah, maybe maybe you want to pick like your your top three or something sure. like that, and and call those out, and then then people can can go directly to you if they want more. I don't want to give away your entire bread and butter here, but <laughs> maybe a little sampling of it would be great. Okay, great. Um, so one of the strategies is to support and enhance Santa Monica's most important facets. So uh, obviously we've got some uh, some icons. Obviously the Santa Monica Pier and our beach are a huge driver of positive brand perception and sentiment. Um, but the experience there is not always ideal, and the research showed that sometimes people think it is um, unsafe, or sometimes people think that it could be more clean, or um, that people don't know all the events that are taking place. Like there's not. There was some research that showed that there's not anything new to talk about, which is interesting from my perspective, because I feel like um, the peer is always doing really interesting and, and creative and fun events. But clearly from a marketing perspective, how do we package that, communicate that out and really affect brand perception? So, um, so it's kind of, you know, this strategy is about not moving away from the icons and the most important facets, because it is 
the icon. It is um, what people think of and it attracts them. But we need to ensure that those experiences are looked after, improved, enhanced, and thought about from the next 10 years. So that's one. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Um, number two is um, highlight and leverage cultural and historic experiences. Santa Monica has a really cool history, um, the beginning of skateboarding and um, fascinating uh, history of the pier, and gambling ships that used to dock out, outside in the ocean. Um, but if you're a visitor and you're walking around town, it's really hard to just come upon those stories. So uh, we're looking at developing, you know, how can we utilize augmented reality and how can we curate and create experiences that bring these stories to life? And then um, number, uh, another one would be enhancing mobility for visitors and residents. So what do you mean by that? Yeah. So um, if you're staying at one of our hotels, we have a, a number of hotels that are walking distance to the Third Street Promenade, to the beach, to Santa Monica Pier. It's so easy to get around on foot. And that's fine. There's a lot to do there, and it's a very bustling area, but we want to showcase the rest of Santa Monica. So yeah. if someone's staying on a hotel by the beach, but they want to get to uh, Bergamot Station, which is a collection of art galleries on the eastern end of town, what's the experience like for them to get there? Um, if they wanted to ride a bike there, what does that look like? It's a little bit harder to navigate. Uh -huh. So we want to look at the various places that we want visitors to explore and get to and make sure that that experience is fun, safe, easy, and maybe even an experience unto itself. So I love that you're looking at that. You're gonna, I'm going to get a little bit on my soapbox here. I hope you don't mind. But <laughs> I think a lot of people think they're over tourism. I think a lot of people think they have too many visitors when in reality – two of the 40 attractions within the destination are getting so many visitors yeah. and you don't have a quantity problem. You have a distribution problem, right? You're, exactly. you're not doing enough to, to tell them about the other amazing experiences that are available. So I, I love to hear that you're looking at that because I feel like so many destinations will just say, oh, well, our top two attractions are packed. So we need to turn our advertising off or we need to, no. to you know, we, there's actually, especially in national parks, a lot of times you get the attitude of, hey, there's too many people here. We got to right. shut it down. Right. And anyway, I now yeah. soapbox done. I'm off. I'm good. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you on the soapbox. <laughs> good. Good. Well, I'm, I'm glad you guys are looking at that. So did that lead to like, are you guys already far enough along to where it's like, okay, here's exactly how we plan to handle that distribution, or are you still working on that? So we're putting the final touches on the plan itself, and in terms of next steps, um, we've identified, according to these eight strategies, we've identified what work has already been um, in progress that we can look at as how can we keep this momentum going? What are some early wins? And then building some short-term and long-term goals according to each of the strategies. And then also, how are we going to measure success according to the strategies? Um, and what we realized uh, towards the creation of the plan was that in order to get this thing implemented, we wanted one independent person to look after this first year of implementation uh -huh. And we're really lucky. Not every destination is going to have this, but we're really lucky to have retained um, a woman who used to be the assistant city manager for the city. Oh. And she um, most recently came from our local community college. So she knows all the players. She knows all of the policies. She has a track record for bringing the right groups of people together in order to get things done. So she's kind of like a unicorn. And yeah. uh, we're really happy to have, have brought her on board and really excited to get started and, and know that she'll kind of spearhead this process really well. That sounds like a home run. And, and it really, it, it, shoo, it's so funny because I was about to ask you a question around, okay, like eight strategies is a lot to roll up into a major plan. Yeah. Uh, and so how in the world are you going to stay on top of everything? Yeah. But it sounds, sounds like you guys have a great plan for that with this uh, former assistant city manager. 
Yeah, definitely. And it's one of the things that I've um, brought up in, you know, industry conferences as we're all talking about experience management plans and tourism master plans is as the tourism board is beginning to lead these is, okay, so who in your office is doing this? <laughs> because uh-huh. uh, as CMO, I have got a full plate of, you know, marketing and public relations efforts and strategies. So um, we're really lucky to have retained um, this woman to kind of go from here. And I think far too many plans, just in general, regardless of the type of plan, whether it's an experience management plan or, you know, a brand improvement plan or or tourism master plan or whatever it is, they do such a great job of putting it together and and presenting it to everyone, getting buy in, and then it goes on the shelf, and six months later, you're way off, you know. Right. So right. I, I'm I'm glad that that that's your approach, and that you're sharing that with other destinations as you go across conferences. Yeah, definitely. Well, okay, so. Eight strategies is a lot, and and mm-hmm. even though you have one person that's going to be able to execute on it, what's kind of step one? Where where are you guys starting? What's your basic? Okay, let's lay the foundation with this, and this will kickstart what we do. Step one is rolling it out. Um, we are, are going to kind of devise a community rollout strategy. Um, we have a big annual meeting in in May each year called our Tourism Summit, and this. This plan and these eight strategies are going to serve as the theme for that event, Um, but it's going to neighborhood group meetings and talking about the fact that um, these strategies are strategies that residents can get behind. It's not something that is just tourism directed. It wasn't something that was tourism led entirely. It was a, a group of various stakeholders who gave feedback and input and helped build this plan. So it's really about getting the the residents' arms around this and and showing that this will improve their quality of life as well. Um, And also identifying champions for some of these strategies. You know, are there members of our city council that um, maybe one of these strategies is totally in alignment with their goals for the city? So um, identifying who are the key players and champions who can help move these things forward. Great. Great. Okay. I want to boil it down to a couple of takeaways for our listeners. First of all, how do I know if I need to even do a brand perception study? Well, I mean, I think if there are um, potential threats and headwinds in your future, you know, potential economic downturn or or factors or um, looking at your hotel performance, I think that that's um, really a great starting point. Yep. So if if there's been some sort of, uh, like if, if you're looking at a heart monitor, right, all the beats are kind of the same. That means you're going steady. But if there's a major variance one way or another, hey, we may want to take a look and see if this is an indication of a much larger issue to come, right? Right. Well, I think, you know, from our hotel performance perspective, one of the other things that we wanted to look at as we addressed uh, or as we began this brand perception study was, our average daily rate for 2019 from a destination wide perspective was $378. So pretty high. And yeah. with that price point, I believe would come an expectation of the level of product, the level of service and the level of experience that happens when you go outside of those hotel doors. And um, that was the other thing that we wanted to look at is if we're going to continue to grow rates how are we going to deliver an experience to meet the expectations? Yeah. I, that's so important it yeah. is, is progress is, is critical, right? Cause rates are as competition increases and everything, rates are going to go up. But if that experience doesn't, at some point there's a breaking point where yeah. it's like, okay, Santa Monica is not worth it anymore because right. the experience doesn't match the cost. So I love that you guys are continuing to improve that and show progress. Right. Well, Kim, this has been great stuff. And obviously, we could probably talk. We only got to three of the eight strategies, right? We could talk <laughs> about this for a long time. Uh, what What do you feel like is, is something that maybe I haven't asked you, but you feel like other destinations would need to know? Well, if I can shamelessly plug something for oh, a minute. Oh, absolutely. We're all about the shameless plug here. <laughs> shamelessly plug. Um, so for other destinations and, and small, large, no matter the size, we actually created our own customer service and brand training program. It's called I Am Santa Monica. We've been okay. running it for about 10 years. 
Um, it's designed for frontline hospitality employees, concierge, waiters, um, transportation, front de- hotel front desk staff, um, to give them a sense of the experience that is outside their day-to-day job, um, to educate them on you know, some of the laws and ordinances that are in effect in our city that visitors might not know about and might ask them questions about. So it's kind of you know the, the do's and don'ts, but also here's the destination brand. Here's why we promote this community. Here's why people are visiting so you can better deliver an unforgettable experience to your customers. So uh, the shamelessly plugging part is we actually created this program as a template that we sell to other destinations. Oh, gotcha. So if there are other tourism boards that, you know, are doing tourism master plans where customer service is a, a key component and you might be looking into customer service training programs. We offer one. So it's called I Am Your Destination. So insert whatever tourism destination there. And um, it's it's up for sale and be happy to talk to anyone who's interested. Kim, let's take this shameless plug one step further. Okay? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so we have a LinkedIn group called Destination Marketers. And I would love to have you post the link sure. uh, to your program, the I Am Your Destination program, yeah. so that people, if they want to learn more, kind of know where to go. How, how would you feel about doing that for us? No, oh, that's great. That's definitely taking a step further and happy to great. do that. <laughs> great, great. Well, I, I love the, the idea of a customer service training within a destination seems a lot of people would say, "Oh, well, that's not that's not our role. As des- we're, our role is to market the destination. It's the hotel's problem how they handle customer service. That is so short sighted because the customer experience is what decides whether or not we can sustain our growth over time, right? And and, and I love that you guys are focused on that. So, yeah. thank you for coming on and sharing your knowledge with us today, Kim. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to be with you. Oh, the pleasure's all ours. We we really appreciate you taking the time. Um, and, and we'll look forward to that link in the Destination Marketers LinkedIn group. Great. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. This has been another wonderful episode of the Destination Marketing Podcast. Reminder for everyone, if you haven't joined the Destination Marketers LinkedIn group, guess what? You're not going to have the link we talked about today. So go join that group. Uh, everybody's posting and sharing their knowledge. And we're all trying to grow together so that we can be better and better destination marketers. Other than that, thanks for your time and we'll see you next week.